All right, we should be recording. Okay, so thank you guys for coming to my Clean Belts, Clean Waters class today. It's a little bit different. Um, I'm used to doing these in person and not virtually, so this is my first kind of virtual experience with it. So hoping it goes smoothly. Um, forgive any hiccups that might happen along the way. Um, like I said, uh, if there are questions that come up along the way, feel free to unmute yourself or put them in the chat and I'll do my best to keep an eye on those and we'll just kind of get rolling. So um, to start out with AIS in Wisconsin, we do have what's called the Wisconsin Lakes Partnership. So that is a partnership between um, the Wisconsin DNR. They kind of provide the sciencey side of things, the research sides of things. Um, UW Extension, so that education component as well. Um, they're also providing um, a lot of research that goes into invasive species work in the state. And then the third component is citizens. So people like most of you guys um, who are either volunteering or getting hired to do uh, clean bills, clean waters work or different AIS related work. So all of those uh, things come together and form kind of our Wisconsin Lakes Partnership and our AIS program in Wisconsin. So this is a nice little goofy theme, I guess, for you guys, uh, comic for you guys. Um, so a little bit, oh, was somebody talking? Nope, okay, sorry. Um, so just gonna briefly go over the agenda super quick. So um, I'm going to start out with talking about like what are invasive species, how do they get here, why are they bad. Um, then we'll go into some ID of common invasive species around Wisconsin. And then we will chat about clean boats, clean waters, kind of how that program works and um, how the actual inspections work for that. So as I'm sure most of you guys know, uh, Wisconsin has a lot of water, so we have um, 11,000 square miles of water, 15,000 lakes, 43,000 miles of rivers and streams, a ton of wetlands. Obviously, we have two great lakes here in the state as well, so that is a huge amount of water. Um, and on all of that water, we have an estimated 1 million boats per year visiting, so that is a big number considering Wisconsin's population is around 5 million. That's that's a big chunk of people. So um, with that comes the challenge of invasive species. So we have all of that water encompassing the whole state, and then we have all of those boats um, kind of going back and forth between water bodies. Um, and that's how a lot of our invasive species are going to be transported and kind of uh, the basis of a lot of the work that we do. So what are invasive species? So these are non-native species that can take over um, in a new environment. So they can be from other parts of the world, other parts of the country even as well. Um, and they come here and I guess I'll touch on the fact that not all non-native species are invasive first. Um, we can have species from other parts of the world, other parts of the country that come here and they are not invasive. They kind of play nice, so to speak, with our native species. Um, in order for a species to be considered invasive, they kind of have to fall under these three characteristics here. So no natural predators, whether that's something that eats them, a parasite, a disease, something like that. Um, native species aren't able to hide or compete or fight back against these invasive species. And then they are also often aggressive, prolific, meaning they have a lot of babies and uh, mature very quickly. So if we have all of those components, a species, a non-native species can act invasive. So how do they get here? Um, a lot of the species that have come here in the past have been introduced via ballast water and just shipping in general from the Great Lakes. So as you know, we have Great Lakes in Wisconsin, Superior in Michigan, um, and particularly in my area of the state, we're close to Lake Michigan, we're close to Milwaukee, which is a big port that um, things are getting shipped into. And if you're not familiar with shipping or ballast water, ballast water is essentially the water that can be 
sucked up into a ship or um, deposited out of a ship in order to maintain the buoyancy on the water, depending how much cargo you have on that ship. Um, so yeah, that's water that can be taken up somewhere else, shipped and then discharged in a new area. Um, so yeah, like I said, a lot of species come through the Great Lakes uh, via shipping. Uh, another route is intentional introduction, so stocking. So some of our species, uh, invasive species, have been intentionally introduced um, as either bait species or um, socked fish species sometimes, um, so that can occur. Canals and migration from the ocean, once again, we are connected to the ocean via that St. Lawrence Seaway, so there is um, a level of natural migration through there. So if things are getting into the Great Lakes kind of closer to the East Coast, uh, they can eventually get here uh, through the chain of the Great Lakes. The nursery industry, so um, if you think about plant nurseries, um, they can be aquatic plant nurseries as well, so or wetland plants. Some of our wetland plants have been introduced because they look really pretty and people buy them to put in their yards, not realizing that they are actually really invasive. Um, anglers in the bait industry, like I just touched on a minute ago, uh, some bait species can be invasive and have been either dumped into waterways or accidentally released into waterways and then established themselves. Aquaculture, so basically raising fish species outside of their native range, and then also the aquarium trade. <clears throat> and that can be aquarium fish, but it can also be things like aquatic plants that people buy to put in their aquariums as well. So how do they spread? Um, the main vector of spread is going to be boaters and anglers. So I kind of touched on that a minute ago when I mentioned all the water that we have in Wisconsin and all the boaters that are traveling from water body to water body. So you can see in this picture on the top, that's a pretty common sight to see at a lot of our lakes. Um, a trailer getting pulled out of the water and just covered in weeds. And if we're not cognizant about cleaning that off, that can be really easily spread to a new place. Uh, other water users, not really gonna touch on these much, but things like seaplanes, scuba divers, things like that, they can spread invasive species. Um, water gardens and aquarium owners. So like I said, uh, people can buy certain plants for water gardens or certain wetland plants for their yards, um, not realizing they're invasive and they can either escape or be sometimes intentionally released from that area. And then also natural dispersal. So obviously, Biologically, things tend to reproduce and spread, uh, so you can have that natural dispersal of any of these species as well. So why do we care about this? Um, most people, I, I guess at least most people in my circle, would initially think, well, the ecological reasons, they can um, mess up our native fish and plant species, uh, really kind of mess up the ecology of a lot of the places that the habitats that we have here. Um, but there are also other impacts, so particularly economic impacts. So things like sport and commercial fishing. If you have a really high quality water body that's not impacted by invasive species, people are going to be more likely to come there, launch their boats there, recreate there, um, kind of get that money going into the economy around there. But alternatively, if you have lakes that are being degraded by invasive species, people may be less likely to come. Or when they do come, they realize, oh, it's really difficult to fish when there's a giant mat of plants on the lake or when, you know, it's taken over by invasive species. Um, property owners as well, sometimes properties on water bodies impacted by invasive species can have their property values decrease. Um, so obviously not something that people really want to happen. Um, and then recreational impacts as well. So I, I kind of just touched on that with boating and angling. Um, people are kind of less likely to come to an area that may be super weedy, super impacted by um, invasive plants or um, other species. 
So uh, before I jump into the ID section, any questions? Great. Take a look at the chat. So I'll jump into our ID portion and I do have some of these species. I'm going to attempt to show them to you on the camera, but I don't know how that's going to go. So we'll see. Um, OK. So the first one we have is Eurasian water milfoil. So this is, I would say, the most common aquatic invasive species in Wisconsin, at least in my area of Wisconsin. So this is an aquatic plant. Um, it's found in over 900 lakes and rivers. It's it's very common. You can kind of see on the bottom here what it does uh, when it invades a water body and form these really dense mats on top of the water, which can crowd out our native plant species. And then also when those dense mats are on top of the water, that's going to be blocking out a lot of sunlight from penetrating the water, which everything that's alive pretty much needs sunlight to survive in some way or another. So that can be really problematic for um, any species underneath those large mats. Uh, the problem with this species, too, is that it can spread via really small fragments. So I'm going to show you a picture here. So it can spread via fragments like a couple inches long. Um, and basically what happens is it's the same idea if you're like, if you take a cutting off of a plant and you put it in water to propagate it. Um, if you have a little bunch of milfoil and you say in this picture, you drive your boat motor straight through this big mat of weeds and chop them up, this is what's gonna happen. These little fragments are gonna spread around the lake and then they can sprout what's called adventitious roots and essentially create an entirely new plant. So um, really easily spread, really problematic in that way. And this is just a distribution map of Eurasian water milfoil. So like I said, very common in Wisconsin and particularly in my two counties. So Washington and Waukesha County, it's very common. Next one we have is curly leaf pondweed. So this is another aquatic plant. Um, it's been here for quite a long time as well. And I would say it's probably the second most common invasive species or at least invasive plant species. Um, and the issue with this one is that its growth cycle is kind of weird. So when we think about plants growing, we tend to think like, okay, it sprouts in the spring, it grows through the summer and blooms and then dies in the fall and winter. Uh, so this species is kind of the opposite of that. So it can grow from October through June. So because of that kind of flip-flopped growth cycle of this plant, this is the one that tends to come up first in all of the lakes around here. Um, so you can go out, I'm sure you could go out right now and see this plant in pretty much every lake um, that it's currently investing. So they tend to sprout up in March or April, which is a lot earlier than our other plants, which will tend to sprout up end of May, beginning of June. Um, and since they're the first ones there, they're able to take over that whole area that's open because no other plants are growing and kind of able to propagate themselves and grow into really big that's similar to the Eurasian water milfoil. <clears throat> um, another problem with that is that they die pretty much all of them by June or July in the year. And because it's kind of like peak summer, it can release those nutrients into the water column when it dies off. And then we can have larger algae blooms in the lakes due to this plant dying off. Um, also, identification for this plant, you can kind of see in this picture, it's got these really distinct wavy leaves that kind of look like the side of like a lasagna noodle. Um, and the leaf edges, they're called margins, like the edge of the leaf, is going to be serrated, so kind of like a butter knife. Um, this one spreads by, oh, excuse me, spreads by rhizomes, which is kind of like root systems. And then also turions, which is what is in this little picture on the bottom. 
And those are essentially like the fruit of the plant or the seed of the plant, if you want to think of it that way. They sprout these turions in June around when they're dying off and they fall to the bottom of the water column. They stay in the sediment and sprout into a new plant the next year. And these turions are really distinct. They're really um, hard. So if you see something that looks like this floating in the water, you pick it up, squeeze it, it's like super hard and pokey. It's probably a turion. You can throw it in the garbage. So distribution of that plant, again, it's very widespread, um, pretty much across the entire state. So a pretty common plant that you'll probably see at most oak orchards. Purple loosestrife. So this is actually a wetland plant, uh, meaning that it likes to keep its feet wet, but it doesn't like to be submerged in water. Uh, this plant was imported because it's very, very pretty. If you've ever been driving on pretty much any highway in the state of Wisconsin, you've probably seen this plant. It's very, very widespread um, and very successful. So it's because it's so successful and widespread, it really crowds out our native wetland species when it gets into a certain wetland, um, which can be really problematic for our wetlands. And this plant spreads super rapidly, so it can produce over a million seeds every year. Plus you get that vegetative spread from the roots of the plant as well. Also, I'm sorry if you can hear my neighbor mowing their lawn. <laughs> Uh, the cons of working from home, I guess. Uh, so purple loosestrife ID, the main ID for these plants that I tell people is that they have a really distinct stem to them. <clears throat> um, their stem is not going to be round like a typical stem you would think of for our native plants. It's going to have a really distinct um, ridge to it, either squared or six-sided. So if you like roll it in your fingers, you could feel those ridges kind of rolling between. Um, and then obviously the very distinct purpley pink flowers that it gets around July through August. Uh, so like I said, it is very widely distributed in the state of Wisconsin and particularly um, down here in Southeast Wisconsin, it's considered heavily infested. All right, this is one I actually have a specimen of, so I'm gonna attempt to show you. Um, so this is the rusty crayfish. It's a crayfish species. We have two invasive crayfish species in the state, and this is one of them. It's been here for quite a while, um, originally brought as a bait species, and it's in just under 800 inland lakes and streams in the state. Uh, the issue with these guys, they are really aggressive they can really reduce our aquatic vegetation, um, which really impacts fish spawning as well. Uh, when fish are spawning, they tend to lay their eggs on aquatic plants or things that they're gonna stick to, right? So if we have something in the water that's impacting the aquatic plants or ripping the aquatic plants out that might have fish eggs on them, obviously those eggs are not gonna do very well. So, <clears throat> ID for these guys, the main identifying factor is going to be this really distinct rusty patch on the side of its carapace. So I cannot see myself. I'm going to do my best. This is a rusty crayfish. And in this specimen, um, you can kind of see those really distinct rusty patches on the side of it. Something you can't see super well, um, but I have a picture of later, is that they also have really distinct banding on the ends of their claws. It's like an orange and black, like Halloween colors, uh, banding on the ends of their claws, which is really unique to this species as well. So like I said, I have a picture later of that that I'll show you guys. So distribution map of these guys, they're pretty widespread. Um, this is one of them that is actually more common in northern Wisconsin, uh, which I find interesting. I feel like Southeast Wisconsin usually takes the, the heavy load of the invasive species, but this one tends to be more common on IDP. Zebra mussels. So most people in this area, I would say, are familiar with zebra mussels. Um, so these are those little guys I'm attempting to get out of a jar right now. <laughs> 
these little guys. You can see those um, little mussels that you'll find in a lot of the lakes and rivers in Southeast Wisconsin in particular. So these guys have been here for 1980s, 40 years, 40-ish years, um, originally introduced from ballast water from shipping into the Great Lakes. Um, they're present in about 300 lakes and streams in Wisconsin, which I feel like is less than people typically think. Um, they're very common in southeast Wisconsin, but I'm going to show you a map of their distribution in a second, showing that they're really not as common in other areas of the state. So I think it's kind of a, we see them everywhere here, so we think that they're everywhere, but they're not. Uh, so the issue with these guys, they'll basically attach to any semi-firm surface, so that can be a boat motor, a pier, a dock, a rock, anything like that, and even like this picture on the top, um, aquatic plants. So this is a picture of Eurasian water milfoil, actually. So it's kind of like a double whammy invasive species right there. Um, so yeah, they can attach uh, to basically everything. They can really mess up people's like boat motors or things that they have in the water. Um, and the species is actually also very sharp. So um, kind of like the edge of that shell here that's going to be sticking up. If you happen to grab onto that or step on them in the water, there's a good chance that they'll slice your hand open, which is not ideal. Um, this species can also be very, very small in the early stages of life, so we can't see it in the water. And I'll kind of touch on that in a minute, well, in maybe like an hour um, later in the presentation about draining our water and the importance of draining our water because some of these species can be so microscopic. Um, zebra mussels can also produce about a million eggs per season. So if you think about, you know, a million eggs, a million eggs, a million eggs, really exponential growth with this species. So this is the distribution of zebra mussels. So as you can see, Southeast Wisconsin and really Eastern Wisconsin in general, they are quite common around here. Um, but as we move kind of West and North, they're really not as common in the lakes out there. So it is still important for us to focus on reducing the spread of this species, despite them being so common in our area. So quagga mussels, basically like the zebra mussels cousin, right? So they kind of do the same thing. They prefer slightly different habitats. So also they are slightly bigger typically. Not sure if you can see this guy, but that is a quagga mussel shell. Um, so again, introduced via ballast water, they're very common in Lake Michigan. Uh, they actually do better in Lake Michigan and the Great Lakes than zebra mussels do because they prefer um, lower temperatures and deeper waters, which is what you're going to get in the Great Lakes. Uh, this species is actually not found, knock on wood, not found inland in Wisconsin. So this is one that is strictly in the Great Lakes so far. Um, and I think I have a slide on, yes, zebra mussels and quagga mussels and how to tell the difference between them. So not that you'll ever need to know how to do this, but I think that it's interesting and fun. So I show people um, zebra mussels. If you can see here in the camera, I'm going to try really hard. They are going to be typically smaller than the quagga mussels. They have this pretty distinct brown striping on the sides, looks like zebra stripes. And um, the main characteristic with these is that they lay flat. So again, I don't know if you can see, but they, if you set them down, they're gonna lay flat on a flat surface. They have a very flat bottom. Quagga mussels, typically bigger, typically lighter in color. And when you set them down, they tip over. So they do not have a flat bottom. So again, not that you'll ever need to be able to do that, but it's just kind of an interesting um, difference. So quagga mussels, again, uh, strictly in the Great Lakes and the Mississippi River so far. 
Uh, spiny and fishhook water fleas. So this species is kind of weird, kind of gross, to be honest. <laughs> um, so this is actually a species of zooplankton. So basically like tiny little critters that live in the water. Um, again, another ballast water introduction. Uh, they are in the Great Lakes. Uh, currently not very widespread in inland lakes, so they're definitely kind of a top priority of trying to prevent uh, from spreading. So currently in about 27 inland lakes and streams. So the issue with these guys, they eat other smaller zooplankton, and zooplankton are what our small fish species need to live. So that's kind of like bear food. So if you think about the bottom of their food chain being completely removed, that's obviously going to have impacts the further you go up as things have them to eat. Um, and you might think, okay, why don't the fish eat them? <laughs> Which is a fair point. But if you can see in this picture on the top here, they have this really long spine that sticks out of the back of them. So I like to explain it like, you're taking a bite of a sandwich and there's a toothpick in the middle and you just bite onto a toothpick, not going to be very pleasant. So the fish typically don't like to eat them very much. Um, another issue with these guys, I'm going to try to show you a little jar here. They're tough to see, but you can see them with the naked eye. They are pretty small. Um, they do tend to clump up like this. Um, and also the picture on the bottom here, you can see them kind of clumped together. They love clumping up on like fishing line, rope, anchor lines, things like that. So they can foul fishing gear really easily. Um, and they're just, yeah, kind of gross to be honest. So this is their distribution. Like I said, primarily in the Great Lakes. Um, there are some lakes up north that have them. And then particularly the Madison chain of lakes over here is infested with this species and then parts of the Winnebago system as well. So what that means for us in Southeast Wisconsin is that, I mean, you can kind of see they're closing in a little bit on our area. So it's definitely a high priority for us to look out for. Um, and another species that's important that we drain our water for, since they are so small and sometimes tough to detect. So hydrilla, I do not have a specimen of this one, which is probably a good thing. Um, we do not have it in Wisconsin. This is another aquatic plant. It's very, very common in the southern part of the United States. So it's kind of like the equivalent of Eurasian water milfoil, but for the south. Um, it does the same things. It, it forms these dense mats, can shade out other plants, can really mess up uh, like navigation in waterways. So this is one, again, that we're keeping an eye out for. I believe that the closest population currently is in southern Illinois. So not super far away, not super close. So we are definitely keeping an eye out for this guy. Um, this one, again, has those serrated leaf margins. So the edges of the leaf are going to have that kind of like butter knife serration on them. And then it also has these really distinct tubers that are going to be present in the sediment. Sorry, stonewort. Um, so this is a species that's very much of local concern in Southeast Wisconsin. Uh, if you're not familiar, it is a newer species. It was discovered in Wisconsin, I believe in 2016. And it was first discovered in Little Muskego Lake, uh, which is in Waukesha County. Since then, it has spread throughout parts of the state of Wisconsin, but I would say the majority is still going to be in the southeast part of the state. So again, another plant that we're very focused on reducing the spread outside of where it already is at. Um, this plant, it's actually a macro algae. So if you think of algae in the water, it's same thing, but it's kind of in the form of a plant. It acts like a plant. So you can think of it as a plant. It's totally fine. Um, it's got this kind of weird, like, forked structure to it. And an easy way to identify it that I found is that the 
the stems of the plant, you can squeeze them between your fingers and they'll pop and all the water drains out and it's like this little clear tube left over. Kind of funky, but our native macroalgae don't do that. So that's typically a pretty tried and true um, identifying point with the species. So this is a big mat of starry stonewort. As you can see, it can get very, very dense um, in like, uh, like monocultured populations like that, which, and it's also a very ropey kind of species. It's pretty hardy. So I can get like caught up in boat loaders and mess up things like navigation in waterways as well. Uh, so this is kind of a better picture of starry stonewort out of the water. So that kind of weird like forking structure that you'll see. Um, and then this little thing on the bottom is what's called a ball bill. And I actually have some here. I'm going to try to show you. They're pretty small but you can see them with the naked eye. And the ball bills are essentially like the seed of starry stone. So they're going to be attached to the roots of the plant and they stay under the sediment in the water. Um, but if you pull starry stone wort out of the water, typically those roots will come with it. They kind of like fishing line and um, the ball bills will be attached to those roots. And this is primarily how this species is going to spread as well. And since it's so easy to get these bubbles out with the roots of the plant, if we're getting those caught up on like boat motors and things like that, it's going to be pretty easy to spread the bubbles from place to place. So distribution of starry stonewort, like I said, it is, um, it was first found in Waukesha County, so it is pretty, um, isolated for the most part to Southeast Wisconsin, but there are some areas up in like Sturgeon Bay that it's found and a couple counties going closer to central Wisconsin that it has spread to as well. Water lettuce, this is another species that we don't have here, but we're kind of keeping an eye out for. Um, so like the name says, it literally <laughs> looks like a head of lettuce floating on top of water. Um, it's kind of like a lily pad-esque species. It has these really distinct spongy, squishy leaves to it. Um, it's it's a very distinct plant. We really don't have anything like it here, so pretty easy to pick out. And this is one that I ask if anyone sees something like this on the water, please let me know, because uh, it's definitely something that we want to know about as soon as possible. And the same goes for this guy. This is called water hyacinth. And again, a lily pad-esque species. It floats on top of the water. It's very distinct from our native lily pads because of this uh, big like air sac thing that holds the leaves above the water. Um, we don't have anything that looks like this in Wisconsin. And then also it has this very distinct uh, six-petaled purple flower to it. Uh, as well. So again, if you see, basically, if you see any weird looking lily pad species, that's something that we definitely would like to know about. Uh, New Zealand mud snails. I do have some of these guys as well. They are very, very, very small, as you can see in the picture there. This is like a resin block with the snails in them. Very small. And this is like a tiny little jar. With the snails as well. So as you can imagine, they are very hard to see, they're very hard to find, and they're very easy to transport. Um, so these guys can reproduce really quickly. They reproduce by cloning. So they can, you know, like millions and millions of these snails in a really small area, and they can blanket uh, like riverbeds. They're typically more found in rivers and streams. So they can blanket riverbeds and kind of like push out other native species, um, take resources that like native snail species need. And another issue with these is that they can live out of the water for like a month, which is kind of insane. Uh, typically, most of our aquatic species will die out of the water within five days. 
So a lot of our decontamination methods involve drying things for five days. So everything is dead and no longer viable. Um, but with these guys, it's a lot more difficult because they're able to survive for so long. Uh, these guys are not very widespread at all. So another one that we're like really keeping an eye out for. Uh, their main population is in the Madison area. And then as of, I think, August of last year, there was a small population found on the border of um, Jefferson and Walworth County in, I believe, the Turtle Creek is what it's called. So it is kind of like slowly moving um, and not that far away from my area, at least. So something we're keeping an eye out for. Uh, mystery snails. So we have two types of mystery snails. We have the Chinese mystery snail, which is that picture on the top. That is a very, very large, very distinct snail species. And I have one here. You can see I have small hands, but it's pretty big. Um, it's a lot bigger than any of our native snails that you're going to see. Um, these ones can be found in lakes or rivers. I've seen them at a lot of boat launches, actually. Um, and we also have banded mystery snails, which are typically a lot smaller in size, but they're very distinct and easy to identify because of this brown horizontal striping on their shells. Again, uh, could be found in lakes or streams. I've seen them mostly in lakes. Um, so issues with these guys, they reproduce very rapidly, like most of our other species. Um, they can die off in kind of mass amounts. So if you picture like a fish kill that might happen on a lake where a bunch of dead fish are washing up on the shore, the same thing can happen with these snails. And that's really gross. <laughs> and it's going to be like millions of shells just like crunching under your feet at the beach, uh, which is not ideal. Um, and some of these snails also carry a certain parasites in them. They're a host to a parasite that if waterfowl eat them, which waterfowl are going to be the main predators of snails, they're going to be the ones eating them. If they do eat them, um, they can get really sick and die from this parasite. So that's just kind of another reason that these guys are not so good. And I believe this is the last species I have for you guys. And this is the Asian clam, Asiatic clam. Its name was actually recently changed to golden freshwater clam, I believe. Um, so like the name says, it's a clam species from Asia. It's very common in like Eastern Asia and it's really common as, as a food species actually. So we think that it either came over in ballast water or possibly as like food import um, because it's such a popular thing uh, in Asia to eat. So these guys are pretty distinct. You can kind of see in the picture on the top, it has a very pronounced ridged shell. I'm going to try to show you guys again on the camera. So uh, with that ridged shell, you can kind of like like uh, rub your fingernail down it, it's going to be kind of like a washboard, uh, which is unlike our native clam species. So that's kind of an easy way to tell the difference between those guys. Uh, these can be in lakes and streams, both. I've seen them in streams, mostly in my area. Um, this is the distribution of Asian clams. So kind of, again, that trend of being mostly in Southeast Wisconsin, uh, but there are a couple areas in the rest of the state as well that they have been found. So um, any questions on the species? I'll kind of pause for a second if you want to ask. Feel free to unmute or put it in the chat, or if you have no questions, you can sit silently. All right, well, if anything comes up, just let me know. Feel free to unmute or read in chat. We'll plug along here. So Wisconsin's AIS program, 
the main goal of our program in Wisconsin is to prevent the introduction and limit the spread of aquatic invasive species. Um, our goals with that, we focus on containment. So once an invasive species has been introduced somewhere, it's usually impossible to eradicate it, unfortunately. So what we focus on is containing it to where it's already been introduced. Um, increasing AIS awareness and responsible behaviors. So that can be done through like education outreach programs or like classes like I'm doing right now. Uh, responsible behaviors that kind of plays into our clean boats, clean waters aspect. And I'll touch on that in a little bit. And then um, strengthening our partnerships. So those partnerships that I mentioned earlier, DNR, um, educational outlets, citizen science, things like that. So elements of the AIS program, education and outreach, like I just mentioned, watercraft inspection, so clean boats, clean waters. Uh, citizen lake monitoring is a program you can get involved with uh, if you live on or near a lake. Um, you can actually volunteer to go out and collect data uh, routinely kind of throughout the year. And they measure like water clarity, water chemistry sometimes. We look for invasive species sometimes through that program, so it's pretty cool. Uh, purple loose drive biocontrol. Uh, so if you're unfamiliar with biological control, that's kind of where you introduce another species in order to help control an invasive species. So for purple loose stripes, we actually have uh, a beetle species called Gallaricella or Sella beetles that eat pretty much exclusively purple loose stripes. So we have a program where we rear these beetles. We can get like hundreds of thousands of beetles, um, depending on the rearing operation. And we can release those beetles out into big populations of purple loose stripe, and they'll basically eat it and help us manage those populations. Um, aquatic invasive species grants. So there are grants available for AIS work throughout the state. Uh, research, like I said, UW system especially and DNR does a lot of research. And then the rules to prevent spread of invasive species. So why watercraft inspection? So uh, if you remember, <laughs> I mentioned we have millions of boaters on our waters every year and boats are kind of that main vector of spread for aquatic invasive species. So if we want to prevent the spread of aquatic invasive species, the main group that we want to be able to contact are boaters and people that are recreating on the water. So, oops, um, having people actually out at the launches, talking to these people, you know, one-on-one, -on -one, being able to explain AIS, why it's important, why the laws are important is uh, really, really vital to this program and the success of this program. So here we have a couple invasive species. We have curly leaf pondweed, fog of mussel, milk whale, water fleas, and oh yeah, this is the picture of the rusty crayfish actually that I was talking about before. So you can kind of see that um, banding on the tips of its claws where it's pretty distinct, like black and orange banding. So that's something unique to that crayfish. So that's another ID thing. Uh, but anyways, we have several different species here. And the nice thing about aquatic invasive species is that they can all be prevented using the same prevention methods. So those methods being inspecting boats, trailers, and equipment, removing all attached plants and animals, draining all of our water from boats, vehicles, and equipment, never moving plants or live fish away from a water body, and then additionally, buying minnows from a Wisconsin bait dealer and using those leftover minnows only under certain conditions, and we'll touch on that in a minute as well. Um, I won't get into this too much. NR40 is basically just the, the state legislative code that dictates um, invasive species work that we do in the state. So those live bait regulations. Um, I'll do my best to explain this. If you have questions during or after, feel free to ask me. Uh, so 
for live bait in the state of Wisconsin, you can have your live bait. I'll, I'll do an example. We'll say we're going out to Big Cedar Lake in West Bend. So I have my live bait that I bought from a certified bait dealer. <laughs> um, I take them out to the lake. I use them to fish. Um, I come back in. I didn't add any water, any fish, anything to my bucket. You can then take those minnows and use them again on Big Cedar if you want, or you could go down to Little Muskego and use them on that lake as well. You could take them anywhere you want in the state. However, if I were out fishing and I introduced lake water into my bait bucket or other fish or really anything um, that's like touched the lake water, then you're only able to use that live bait on the same water body because we don't want to be moving um, water from lake to lake. So hopefully that makes sense. Um, also, you are not allowed to transport any live fish or fish eggs away from state waters. So live fish meaning fish in water. Um, some people like to transport their fish in a cooler, like to keep them fresh technically illegal, um, but you can use ice as a substitute to that, um, and it works just as well. All right, um, any questions? I'll take another little short question break. <clears throat> All right. So um, I always say that the first half of this presentation is like very doom and gloom and like <laughs> everything is horrible and there's invasive species and they're destroying everything. But what you really need to know about AIS is that um, inspectors really do make a difference. Uh, so our clean boats program really makes a difference in the state. So the main goals of the Clean Boats, Clean Waters program, we train our volunteers, citizens, and staff to conduct voter education campaigns in communities, uh, conduct those um, watercraft inspections, do the education outreach with the voters. Uh, we've had over 2,500 people trained since uh, the inception of the program, which was 2004, so that's pretty cool. Um, and a lot of different type of people can be involved in this program. So we can have volunteers, so people that maybe live on or near a lake and are just interested and genuinely care about the lake and you know want to dedicate their time to doing this. We can have DNR staff. So occasionally there are DNR staff that are paid to do these inspections. I have um, some interns that I employ over the summer season that are um, paid to do these clean boats inspections. Uh, student interns, I got ahead of myself, so that's that part. And then occasionally uh, Department of Workforce Development adults as well will be involved with this program. So basically there's a lot of different people who can be involved. Really anyone who's interested can get involved in this program. So the actual inspections, um, the materials that you'll need when you're actually out at the boat launch. Um, first and foremost, uh, Clean Boats, Clean Waters t-shirt, hat, apron, sticker, basically anything that's showing this is who I'm affiliated with and I'm not a random person trying to touch your boat um, is good. Uh, we just want to make sure that uh, kind of, we have that kind of affiliation. People know that that's why we're out there. <clears throat> that's who we're out there with uh, representing. A clipboard and pencil. So we do have a data sheet that I'm going to show you in a couple slides that we fill out at the boat launch um, when we do the boat inspections. Uh, boat landing script, watercraft inspection, checkpoint list. These are all things um, that can be found on the Clean Boats website. And I actually linked that in the chat for you guys. If you're not able to see it, let me know and I can like relink it or email it to you as well. Uh, so that's going to have like all the materials that are listed here and that I'm going to talk about um, in a few slides. Um, we'll skip a few plastic bags. That's if you find something suspicious um, and you want to take a voucher of it, you're able to put that in like a plastic bag, write 
the place you found it, maybe what you think it is. Um, and that's something that you, at least if you're in Washington and Waukesha County, that's something you can reach out to me with or um, your county's local coordinator or the DNR AIS coordinator as well. Uh, cell phone, local contacts, camera violation form. So the cell phone, local contacts are really important. Um, if you're having issues, particularly, um, I would say that 95% of people are really receptive and nice and like genuinely care about our lakes um, and they'll hear you out, they'll follow the rules and they'll be really good about it. But you always, well, not always, but sometimes have that bad egg, right? That's like not going to want to hear anything you're saying and thinks that the lake is just a big swimming pool and Maybe he's been out like drinking on their boat or something. So just like not having what you're saying. Um, and we do have like violation forms that we can go through for that. If you're someone volunteering in my counties, you could call me. Um, and we also, I also put in chat the Wisconsin DNR warden tip line. So if something's like really going down and you need some help, uh, those are people that you can reach out to. So. Um, our inspector duties. So first and foremost, the Clean Boats program is an education and outreach program. We are not law enforcement. We're not enforcing things. We're not like chasing people down the road because they have plants on their boat trailer. Not our job. That's the warden's job. Um, we're not going to worry about that. Um, so we are there simply to inform and educate people about what AIS are, why they're bad, those steps that they can take to prevent the spread. Um, also there to perform watercraft inspections. So basically looking at people's boats and trailers, making sure that they clean them off, that they drain their water from their motors and their coolers and everything like that. And then um, collecting and reporting the data on kind of what we experience throughout that process. So again, this is that boat landing message of that inspect, remove, drain, never move. That'll be, um, you've probably seen at pretty much any boat launch, they'll have a big red and black AIS sign that'll have these steps on there as well. So um, when we're actually performing these inspections and chatting with people at the launch, like I said, we'll discuss those, um, these prevention steps. Perform that watercraft check, and it's really helpful to involve the boater in that as well. So versus like, hey, can I look at your boat and touch your boat? Or, hey, can I help you with anything? Or like, can I help you inspect your boat? Or can you help me look at your boat? Um, it's really helpful to kind of get people involved. Um, we do have some like brochures and stickers and things that we can hand out to people if they're interested in that kind of thing. Uh, I will say we've had people in the past uh, kind of complain that they've been thrown into the lake afterwards. Like people will take the brochure from you and be like, okay, don't care, throw it in the lake. So really only give that material out to people that seem genuinely interested because obviously we don't want to be throwing junk in our lakes. So this is that data sheet that I referenced. So this is what you'll actually be using when you're out doing the inspections. And it's pretty straightforward. Um, on the top here, you put in like your name, date, time, uh, what lake you're at, landing location, straightforward stuff. And these data sheets read left to right. So again, very straightforward. Was the boat entering or leaving the landing? You can mark which one of those is applicable, move to the next area. The first question that we're always going to ask people is, have you been contacted by a watercraft inspector this season? Um, if you're working at the same launch throughout the whole summer, you'll get to know the people who are regulars. And this question doesn't really, you know, you can mark yes, you don't really have to ask them. Um, but new people people you don't recognize or when you're starting out um you could definitely ask them this question like hey have you seen somebody in a blue t-shirt or a clean boats hat um out at any water body in wisconsin this season um and they'll say yes or no 
move forwards. Uh, the next question, are you willing to answer a few questions? They're going to say yes or no. If they say no, that's fine. Uh, we're not like hunting people down for data. It's not that important, especially if somebody's like annoyed about talking to you. Um, there are a couple ways that we can go about getting the message across, even if they say no. So if someone's like, no, I really don't have time, you could always say, okay, well, uh, just remember to clean off your boat and your trailer and drain your water when you're leaving or coming and going, um, thanks, bye. It could be as easy as that. And then we're still kind of getting the message out there without like bothering people. Um, but if they are willing to answer questions, uh, the next little chunk here, was the boat used during the past five days on a different water body? They'll say yes or no. And then if they say yes, you can ask them if they remember what water body that was or what county it was, what state it was. Sometimes people come from Canada, what country it was. Um, or if they say they don't know, there's a little uh, column for don't know on the side here. Um, and the reason we ask for that like five day window, I touched on it briefly before. So most of our uh, aquatic species are not going to be alive or viable once they've been out of the water for five days. So one of our decontamination methods is letting things dry for five days. So if, in theory, if their boat has been out of the water for five days, it's really not as important to know uh, where they were coming from. Uh, the next little column over here is number of people contacted. So if you have a boat with like a family on it of four people, you could say I contacted four people. If it's just like one fisherman, I contacted one person. It's basically the number of people who got your message that you were trying to get across. Um, and the right hand side here, this is going to remind you of those steps that we've talked about. So inspect, remove, drain, never move. Um, and then as well as like draining live wells, the bait message, it's essentially there to help you uh, when you're kind of first getting into doing the inspections or if you like space out and you're like, wait, what am I asking them to do again? Or why is this important? Um, you can kind of refer to that side if you need a little reminder. So the prompts handout, do I have a picture? Yes, I do. So um, this handout is similar to the right hand side of the one we just looked at. Uh, it's kind of a flow chart that can walk you through like the inspection process. It can be helpful for people who are just starting. Uh, just kind of walk through like, wait, why is this important? Or you can even write down like what species are in this link that people might need to know about or you want to talk about. Um, and there's also a little flow chart on the bottom for uh, bait species and kind of a reminder to throw those away, which I don't know if I touched on. I actually can't remember, so I'll touch on it now. Um, if people do have live bait and they're done using it, they're done fishing, they're not going to go back out. Um, remind them to please throw it away in the garbage um, and not into the lake. Because like I said, some of our invasive species have been introduced by people doing that exact thing. So we don't want to do that. So uh, this data collection, that data sheet that I referenced, that all gets uploaded into the statewide database, uh, DNR database called SWIMS. And we can use this data for a lot of different cool things. Uh, so we can determine traveling patterns of recreational users. So that could be like, there's a bunch of people coming from this Starry Stone Lord Lake that are going to this specific lake. Uh, maybe we can focus on messaging about that specific invasive species here and there, um, that kind of thing. So it's kind of cool to be able to like quantify where people are going. Um, this data is also used for things like lake planning grants. Again, if if we have a lake that a lot of people are coming to from like the Winnebago system, which has a bunch of invasive species, you can use that data to be like, okay, it's important for us to maybe put a cleaning station at this launch or, you know, things like that. Um, and then also local ordinance reviews, kind of the same idea. <clears throat> 
So in this bottom box here, we can see the efforts for 2022. There were basically a ton of boat inspections, um, about 137,000, um, almost 272,000 people contacted, and almost 85,000 hours spent throughout the state. So that's pretty huge. Um, and this is kind of that data, but in graph form. So we can see when Clean Boats Clean Water started in 2004, uh, basically the numbers have gone up pretty much every year. Uh, there was like a small dip here in 2018. I think they went down briefly for 2020 because of pandemic stuff. Um, but in general, they keep increasing, which is great. We get more people interested every year and the program expands every year. So handling a violation, I am actually gonna like my last few slides. Okay, yeah. I'm gonna go to a different page. So I linked this um, resources page in the chat box for you guys. If you wanna look through this, these are all the forms that I was referencing, like the PDF data sheet and everything like that. Uh, but the one we're going to do now is this violation form. So like I said, um, most people that you come across are going to be really pleasant and receptive to what you have to say, but occasionally you can have people that are not having it. So if you do have somebody that's like, screw you, I don't care about AIS, I'm going to drive down the road with plants on my car, I'm leaving, I don't care, I'm not draining my water. If you have something like that, first of all, Please be safe about it. Um, never like go after somebody or keep arguing with somebody that is like not in their right state of mind about something like this. The data is not worth to like be berated by somebody on a boat launch. Um, if you do have somebody like this, we do have this violation report form. And again, pretty straightforward. Basically, you're going to want to note anything that you notice about this person. So things that are important, like uh, license plate numbers, if you can get that, or like make and model of a car, uh, voter registration number, what the person looked like, <coughs> excuse me, what the person looked like. Um, and then also even better than your memory, um, taking a picture can work too. So if you have like a smartphone or something that you're able to take a picture, you could do that. And then on the bottom of this form, uh, we have the DNR warden tip line. So that 1-800-TIP-WDNR. And I also put that in like actual numerical values in the chat for you guys as well. So you can call them, let them know this is what's going on um, and they can go chase them down the road or whatever they're gonna do. Um, also, I guess for the record with that, there are fines associated with uh, breaking the AIS laws in Wisconsin. I forget how much they are, but they are in like the hundreds of dollars range. So not saying you should threaten people by any means, but you could always say like, okay, well, just so you know, like there can be like you can get fined for something like this, just so you know, and like kind of drop it. Uh, but that's totally up to you guys. So um, that was really like the last thing I had in this presentation. So that is my contact info. If you guys are in Washington or Waukesha County and you're doing clean boats, if you have like any questions or any issues, or particularly if you find a species that um, is suspicious, you think it's an invasive, uh, you can reach out to me. I put my, uh, both of my emails, I have two emails. I put them both in the chat and then along with my phone number, which I can get calls, text messages. You could like text me a picture of a species if, if um, that works for you. Uh, and we can kind of check that out together. Um, I also have this link down here. I put into the chat because I'm not sure if we watch it on this meeting, if you guys will get the audio, but, um, it's a link to these YouTube videos, which to be perfectly honest with you, they are kind of corny, but I think they're genuinely helpful. 
Um, it's going to walk you through like scenarios that you might encounter doing the clean boats, clean waters inspections. So like general watercraft inspection, somebody leaving with plants attached, uh, somebody leaving with live bait, um, person who like might not be having what you're saying. Um, so I think they're like genuinely helpful. They can kind of show you scenarios that might happen to you while you're out doing these inspections. Um, so that's really all I have for you guys. Any questions, comments, concerns, anything at all, um, we can take that. Hey, Amanda, can you hear me okay? Yes, yeah. Hi, this is Steve from the office. Um, mm -hmm. Question for you, what's your feeling and um, how often do the inspectors help or assist boaters with removing um, AIS from their uh, from their boat trailers? Yeah, so it depends on like, I guess how receptive the people are, to be honest with you. Um, we can always offer to help people, but I, I tell like my interns, like don't go like touching people's equipment or anything like that. Um, but if they, they uh, either ask for the help or accept the offer of you helping, then it's like totally fine for people to help clean off the boats. And I know that a lot of my interns do that pretty regularly, so I think it is pretty common. Yeah, I just from experience at certain times of the year, if you get um, a lot of harvesting in the wrong wind, there'll be huge quantities of um, floating vegetation at the boat launch where it, it, it could take you 10 or 15 minutes to clear mm -hmm. your rig before you leave. So I was just wondering, as, as long as you ask, that's really the first step. Just ask if or if they want assistance, then if yes, then proceed. Right, yeah, and especially at Lower Phantom, I know I've launched many a boat out there, and I know it's very weedy, so I, I feel that pain. Um, yeah, basically just get permission to, like, touch their equipment and stuff before you do anything, but after that, um, as much help as they want and as much help as you're willing to offer is totally fine. Any other questions at all? And I also just want to check, did you guys get my message with those links from before we started the meeting today? Just want to make sure you have like access to that. Well, uh, I'm hoping uh, you did. I did not. Um, oh, you did? Okay, here, I did not let me just, receive anything. Let me just resend this super quick. Guys uh, was it attached to the meeting appointment or was it a separate email? Here, I'm putting it in chat right now. And I'll also email these links to everyone that signed up for the class today so that just to make sure everybody has them. I'm going to stop recording.